Hey everyone, and welcome back to this class, Advanced Convolutional Neural Networks. So what's great about ResNet is that in order to learn about ResNet, we don't have to talk about CNNs at all. Let's just consider a really deep feed-forward neural network for the time being. One thing you've heard me mention in the past is that deeper is better. This is generally the case. If you add more layers, you get more expressiveness and better generalization. The question is, does this rule of thumb have a limit? Can we do something like create a neural network with 5,000 layers and expect it to be the best neural network ever? And of course, like all rules of thumb, there are points at which they break down. And so if you continue to add more layers, what researchers have found is that performance starts to degrade. Let me explain why this is surprising. Suppose we have a neural network that performs very well. Now, as we recall, neural networks are great function approximators. Therefore, a neural network should have no problem at all learning the identity function. In other words, that just means whatever I put in is the same thing I get out, f of x equals x. As this is such a trivial function, you would assume that it is very easy to learn. So let's assume we have a neural network that does exactly this. We attach our identity neural network to our very good neural network. Logically, we know that this must perform exactly the same as the small neural network, because the second part does nothing but pass the value to the end. Now suppose we add yet another identity network. This too should give us the same answer. So what one might deduce from this is that very deep neural networks are great. They should perform at least as good as a smaller neural network because each layer has the potential to just learn the identity function. So what's the problem with this? The problem arises when you actually try to train these networks. While theoretically, if you add on an identity network to a very good network, you get the equivalent of a very good network. In reality, you have to train all the neural network weights simultaneously. And so this approach just doesn't work in practice. The idea that a small neural network should be able to learn the identity function in theory is the most important fact to keep in mind. So let's say we have this mini neural network. It cannot learn the identity function. So what's one way we could help it learn the identity function? Well, that's just to pass the input directly to the output. So we draw this extra line here that bypasses all of the intermediate layers. So if my final expression is f of x plus x, then to get identity, I just have to learn that f of x should always give me zero. The intuition researchers had was that it should be a lot easier for the neural network to learn that f of x should output zero than to output whatever other function was required. And if that function was identity, then the neural network would have an easier time just copying x over and making f of x equal zero than actually trying to get f of x to learn identity. And in addition, if the neural network wants to learn something better than identity, it can do that too because it still has f of x to learn with. So with this new addition, you can think of it as, we can learn at least identity, but if we want to do better, that's okay too. The key concept being, f of x can focus on only having to learn the residuals, or in other words, the desired mapping minus identity. So this is what is called a residual block. It consists of two paths. The first path is just a series of regular neural network layers. We call this the main branch. The second path is a direct path from the input to the output. We call this the shortcut branch. Sometimes this is called a skip connection, but we won't be using that terminology. Now on to some details and conventions. So the previous slides were just meant to give you a basic overview. But now that you understand the concept, we can move on to the details. The first detail that isn't obvious from the usual diagrams that people show you is that the final activation function actually goes after adding the shortcut branch to the main branch. 
So you see here we have two ReLUs, but the second ReLU comes after the plus. Another addition is that the authors also apply batch norm to each layer in the main branch. So recall that batch norm also comes before the activation function. So you have the weight matrix, batch norm, ReLU, weight matrix, batch norm, add it to X, and then the second ReLU. Also recall that when you have batch norm, you no longer need to have bias terms in your dense layer. So now we can finally go back to CNNs and look at the actual blocks that were used in ResNet. Note that we are now going to stop assuming we're looking at feedforward neural networks and go back to convolutions, since all of the residual blocks occur in the convolutional layers of the ResNet. ResNet typically refers to a specific CNN architecture, so that's what we'll be discussing, although there's no reason you couldn't experiment with this principle using other types of layers. In fact, there have been many other kinds of deep residual networks that were inspired by ResNet, some over 1,000 layers deep. When it comes to ResNet, there are actually two different types of residual blocks that we need to learn about. This is sometimes confusing for new students because you're usually taught about the main intuition behind ResNet, but when you get to the details, there are actually two different kinds. So the first kind is exactly what we just talked about. We pass the input directly to the output. However, in terms of what neural network layers go in between, it usually goes like this. First, we have a convolution, then we have a batch norm, then we have the activation function. Recall that we typically use ReLU. Next, we have a second convolution, batch norm, and activation function. But for the third part, we only have convolution and batch norm. Then we add this to the original input x, and then on top of all that, we reapply the activation function. We call this the identity block. One question you might have at this point is, well, in order to add x to the output of the third layer, doesn't this require them to be the same shape? And you're right that this is the case. So typically, we structure our neural net so that this automatically happens. Recall that if you use same mode in a convolution, then the output is the same size as the input. There are, however, some exceptions, in which case what you would do is multiply x by a matrix or a tensor called ws in order to make it the same shape as the last output. This could be a trainable parameter so you could optimize it using gradient descent, or it could just be an identity matrix with zero padding. This brings us to the second type of ResNet block, which is called the convolution block, or the conv block. This is similar to the identity block in that we still have three layers of convolutions, batch norms, and activations. So instead of the shortcut branch just being identity, we now do one convolution and one batch norm. It's still a shortcut since there are still less operations than the main branch. The final step is again to add the output of the main branch and the shortcut branch and apply the activation function. What's really interesting about these two blocks is that while they do contain a novel idea, which is creating this side branch or shortcut branch in a neural network, you still know how to build all these components. In fact, if you're like me, you're already thinking about how you could build this right now without any of my help. The only really interesting operation we have is adding the two branches together. And of course, by now, we all know what addition does. So now that we have a good understanding of ResNet blocks, what does the ResNet actually look like? So the ResNet we're going to use has 50 layers. That's over three times larger than VGG16, which is pretty significant. ResNets with over 100 and even 1,000 layers have been built. Good thing we have all these pre-trained models to use. And just one note, when we count the layers here, we do not include batch norm and pooling as layers. So the only layers we count are convolutions and dense layers. This is despite the fact that a batch norm layer also has parameters. So what's interesting is, if you look at the ResNet paper, I actually found their chart which describes the architecture to be very confusing. 
You are, of course, welcome to try and parse this if you want. It's not really clear to me from this which is a conf block and which is an identity block. Although, other than this, the paper is an interesting read, so I suggest taking a look at it sometime. So the ResNet architecture is this. We first have a convolution, just a regular convolution, then bash norm, and then max pooling. Then we have a conf block, then two identity blocks, then another conf block, then three identity blocks, then another conf block, five identity blocks, then another conf block, two identity blocks, and then average pooling, and then a flatten, and then one final dense layer. So you can see I had some trouble fitting this on the page, so the identity blocks have actually been compressed. So anytime you see some depth, that means there are multiple identity blocks. Now if you count these, there are 16 ResNet blocks, which gives us 16 times 3, which is 48 layers, and then there's the final convolution and the last dense layer, which totals 50 layers. Let's summarize what we learned in this lecture since it was pretty long. First, we discussed the motivation behind why really large neural networks might work in theory, although they don't actually work in practice. We then looked at the shortcut branch concept, which is quite literally a way around this problem. We took this idea to define the actual blocks used in the famous ResNet architecture, which are the conv block and the identity block. We saw that it doesn't actually consist of any components we don't already know about. Finally, we were able to combine these blocks to get the full ResNet, which is a 50-layer neural network. One interesting aspect of the ResNet, unlike many of the other deep learning components we've learned about, is that this technique adds zero new parameters. In other words, we train exactly the same number of parameters as we would have had there been no residual connections. Only the architecture has changed. That's pretty nice because, as you know, more parameters can lead to overfitting, and less parameters means less training time. What's also interesting is, if you read the paper, you'll see that they mention a ResNet with 34 layers actually only requires 18% of the number of operations as a VGG with 19 layers. That's pretty significant savings considering it's almost double the number of layers.